Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with the 500 Plus. So it's had uh, lots of things uh, done to this board in the past. You know, obviously it was a major corrosion repair. Um, just occasionally, I've had a yellow screen with this recently, and it's been driving me nuts. It's around the time I got a pie storm, actually. And I think actually it's a RAM fault, and it's took me ages to work this out. Obviously, I did the usual things like you know, test without that CIA yellow screen, swap the CIA's yellow screen. Uh, reseat Gary and Paula, yellow screen. I haven't swapped these, but I have no reason to believe those are faulty. Um, I swapped the CPU and you know cleaned the pins. wasn't the CPU. Um, what else to do? Removed the RAM expansion. Still a yellow screen. Just made sure that everything's seated in there properly and swap. We had the Agatha here that had the pin damage. You know pins have been broken off that chip. I'll put a link up there. It was on my mate Finson's channel. The, 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 that Agnes was donated by Sparks. So I swapped over for you know a good one. It's just the same, so it's not that. Um, as a final ditch to temper, I thought, let's try Diagram. And actually that boots. So it could be ESD. Literally me just picking the board up, moving it around, could have done this. But it's been something that's, like I say, it's been kind of been really intermittent. Just occasionally I'll get a yellow screen and after a few minutes of messing around trying to work out what it is it will just mysteriously go away well actually it's now a uh, perma yellow screen and if you're going to memory tests uh, I'm pleased this is working though because otherwise I'd be going out this fray just trying to work out the course and if we do extend the chip then look at this straight away it's the uh, lower by there bits five six seven and eight now because these chips all handle four bits each, it's easy to assume, okay, it's gonna be one of them, but you've got eight, haven't you? Because you've got one megabyte. Now, the interesting thing is the usable memory is at the moment 1K, and that's it. It's just sticking like that. So I'm just gonna let this keep going through until it goes through all the range here. Because if we saw 512K of this use usable, we could then assume it is one chip. Whereas if it comes back and we find we haven't got at least 512k usable that's going to indicate that maybe it isn't actually the ram uh, now a temperature on these there's no real clues other than maybe this one just gets i don't know a degree or two warmer than anything else on there so maybe it's this i don't know we've now got 2k usable which is weird this is making me think it isn't the ram actually and it's something to do with the data path now the bits in question well, if this chip is the one, because it's getting warm, I've just looked, goes through these two here. So maybe we've got a bad connection here, or maybe one of these is faulty. Because these are socket, I can just swap these around, put that one there, that one there, that one there, etc. And see if that makes a difference. But assuming the error is the same, at least it's narrowed down to, it looks like, it's the upper half of the lower byte. So, yeah, let's just see what happens. It's weird, isn't it? Look, we've got usable 4K, checked memory 6K. Maybe it's going to be more than 512k. Well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because it's going off um, when it says usable. Well, actually, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not sure how this is doing this. Let's just wait to the end and see what it reports. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to leave that to go to the end because if you look at the address it's on at the moment, it's hardly moved. It's, when it's displaying all this information here, it slows it down significantly. Um, and if you look at the checked memory versus the usable memory, it's about a third, isn't it? It's not exactly a quarter. I'm guessing when it gets 16k checked, it's going to be usable. It's going to be 12, maybe. Yeah, maybe it is then. Maybe it is a quarter of the RAM, which would make sense because it's one out of the four chips there. You know, it's 16 bit, and you can see, you know, very clearly here we've got the red, and it shows it twice because it's like supports 32 bit testing as well but obviously it's a 16-bit system there so you can ignore the stuff to the left just look at the stuff on the right you've got the upper byte and then the lower byte and it's the upper half of the lower byte just switch it off and ground myself uh, and i think i'm mistaken in terms of temperature because that one's warm that one's warm that one's warm that one's warm it's like the the chip to the right of each pair is the ones that's just lukewarm and when it's a lukewarm there's literally a degree difference or two degrees you can barely feel a difference but there is just a slight difference between the left chip and the right chip in each of these pairs so i'm thinking more likely to be something up here actually yeah so it would appear to be a, uh, a ram chip fault because i've got an additional one mega chip ram here and if i start from its uh, starting address which is there 
to uh, 2,000. Technically, it's probably something like one load of Fs actually. And uh, hit that, and then do fast. Disable shutter room, yes. We quickly get one megabyte. You can see that. Uh, now, if I just uh, go back out of there, and we do test the chip RAM. Just looking at the address at the top there. So it starts at 400. Yeah. And we do the same thing. Fast, Sable, yes. Yeah, we get errors look. So this RAM that starts at uh, one and five zeros in hex, that checks out all right. The RAM on here doesn't, which would suggest it's, and because these are both chip RAM, they're gonna be taking the same path. So we've ruled out these, I swapped these around, not sure I mentioned that, so those are swapped around, those were swapped around, same behavior. Yeah, we're left in a scenario here right now where it looks like it is the RAM. It looks like it's got to be the RAM, it can't be anything else. So we just need to go work out which of these chips are connected to the lower byte for the upper four bits. So I think it's U17 and U21. Now I haven't actually looked at the schematics. I uh, was looking at Amiga PCB Explorer. So I'm just trying to find a, uh, a replacement RAM here. I'm just uh, grounded myself. Uh, I'm gonna try the piggyback technique because you know what, it could just save you a world of pain just for a two minutes test here. And not even a two minute, uh, 60 second. So let's try U17. And of course, you know, I should test connectivity perhaps here because that could be the issue. Maybe there's a, a signal not getting to these, like Raz or Kaz or something. Anyway, let's switch that on. I'm just gonna just test it that way, and then we'll do the same with U21. But I do remember seeing green screens just once or twice in the past with this board over the last two years since I fixed it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's always been on my mind thinking, I wonder if the RAM's gonna go on this at some point, and here we go, it has. Uh, extended chip, man. Yeah, that's looking exactly the same. And then we'll test the other one. came back straight away there, didn't it? So looking at the schematics, I think it's U17. Assuming the lower CAS is what we're looking at here because it's the lower block, I think so. So anyway, I'm gonna use hot air to free this up. I'm not even gonna try and dissolve the pins because, well, it's a junky board anyway, and uh, I'm not gonna damage it. I just need to just get this up to temperature and we'll slide it out. That cap there could take offense to this hot air, to be honest. Of course, you could just heat from the underside. There we go. Hopefully no pad damage. Well, they're pretty easy to unblock the holes now and get the socket on. Hopefully that's the right chip. So the holes are all unblocked there. I've cleaned along here with the IPA on the cotton board. And let's get a socket on. You could argue one RAM chip fails, just swap the lot, but this is, uh, you know, just a working board here that I use for testing lots of things. So, uh, yeah, I'm not that fussed if we do get eventually get a failure on another one. It may make another interesting video. <laughs> I don't know. Unblocking one or two of the holes here was uh, a bit of a pain, if I'm honest. You just have to hold it there longer, higher temperature, and hold it for 20, 30 seconds, and then try and unblock. If that doesn't unblock, just get the iron straight back on it, hold it another 20, 30 seconds, and repeat. If you do that too long, obviously, you'll uh, damage the pads. Anyway, that's looking pretty straight there, I think. It's 50 50. It's a calculated 100% in terms of I went for the lower. But you know what? I might be wrong. It might address the upper ones before the lower. Honestly, I do not know. I don't think so. So I'll clean that up in a minute. I'm just gonna go whiz over there with it, get a chip in and test it. So I've got a replacement RAM in. Place your bets, place your bets. Let's switch it on. Oh yes, nailed it. Yeah, that's nailed it. Definitely, that should come up with a sticker disc in screen, I think, hopefully. I'm using Kickstart at the moment. Yeah, there we go. Fantastic, wow, that was painful. That came at a time when I was trying to finish off the TF536 video. The final part of the video there, just doing some testing on the A500 Plus here, and uh, straight away I had that issue. But this has been coming for a while. This happened with the Pi Storm. I had that yellow screen on the Pi Storm a number of times, and it drove me to despair. 
I'm actually thinking it could have been something to do with the problem I had with the Pi Storm, actually. One of the uh, data buffers uh, died on that. I think it was a latch, actually. Um, anyway, I'll talk about it in the Pi Storm video. So swapping back to Dodgy RAM, I want to show you the behaviour with this, actually. It doesn't hit the IDE at all. It just sits there, a black screen. That's the really weird thing when you're using the 536. Obviously, if you're not using the 536, you then get a yellow screen. That was how I discovered I was getting a yellow screen, but... Uh, the first thing I spotted was when I was testing the 536s, this was happening. Black screen, not hitting the IDE. But if I cycle the power, you'll see the early part there, look, with the flashes, is normal. So it's just really weird, isn't it, how with the TF536, it doesn't give a yellow screen. But that RAM is the issue, if I take the RAM out. And you can see the compact flash card here, just watch, switch it on. It never hits it, the LED never illuminates at all. And if we swap that RAM out and put the good one in, let me just ground myself. I really don't like touching this. I'm holding a ground point while I'm doing this. Hang on. With my left hand. Yeah, so I got the RAM in. Switch it on again. Yeah, you got flashed. Flash, flash. It's really weird, isn't it? How <laughs> you get a different behaviour with a 536 versus a stock 68000. Bear in mind, you'd expect Kickstart to be doing the same things in terms of testing the RAM here. It's bizarre. So RAS0 goes to these chips here, and I think RAS1 goes to these chips here. So because it was the lower, I was suspecting it's U17 versus U21. And in terms of, well, how did I know which one of these to go for, with any of these chips to go for, the bits are here. So it goes like, I don't know, I can't read them from here. It's like, it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, and then you've got 4, 5, 6, 7 here. Those are those bits. And obviously they go to this chip, but they also pass through to U21. So those two chips are on those four bits, the four bits that were giving us an error there. The upper four bits of the lower byte. So yeah, it was just the RAS0 rather than RAS1 that made me think it's going to be this one, actually. And I'm sorry if it's not clear as to why I selected RAS0 and found this chip rather than RAS1, which should point to that chip. And I think, and I could be wrong, but I think RAS0 relates to the first 512K. When we did the manual memory test, if we'd started at the address 8000, we would have been pointing at the chip here, actually. And uh, I suspect that memory test would have been okay. It would have been, you know, 512K RAM green all okay. We did the same sort of thing there with this expansion RAM, didn't we? We started at uh, 10,000 hex and uh, tested the RAM here and that all came out good, a full 1024K. But on a 500 plus like this where you've got one meg, you know, you could use that, uh, you know, start at 8,000 and uh, if that passes, you know it's going to be, the, probably the chips to the left, they're going to be aligned that way, aren't they? You know, I was saying, like, the ones to the right get warmer. I think that's because it's the other bank. You know, they're all the same bank, the ones that were getting warm. So, yeah, I would guess if you had a problem with the upper 512k bank there, you're looking at RAS1, which is going to be, I think, U20, U21, uh, U22, and U23, I think, if I've got that <laughs> correct. So what killed that RAM? Well, this probably, <laughs> my hand, probably ESD. It wouldn't surprise me. And based on the fact that I think maybe that's the issue actually, um, I've ordered some large ESD bags for these boards because that is one of the problems. I do handle the chips and things with an ESD wrist strap on 99 times out of 100. And it's the same with the board when the board's here. But I end up having to carry this board from one side of the room to the other. And I often just carry it with my hands, you know, so I'm, I'm careful what I'm holding. But, no, you know, nevertheless, if I was holding this board here and my hands under there and I'm walking, 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 static electricity, you know, um, that is a possibility. So I've ordered some large ESD bags just for storing these and for transiting them from one place in the room to another before I can actually get my wrist strap on uh, just to protect against that. But that's the sort of thing that can easily kill RAM. But of course, everything has a finite lifespan. You know, they could have just come to end of life, these actually. They've been used an awful lot just by me. I've used these for God knows how many hours on this board. And I think actually when I reclaimed some of those chips off those other boards, those were Siemens ones and there were the occasional faulty one. Uh, other makes like the sharp ones and stuff, they don't seem to get as many failures I've found. So I did get 20 of these ESD bags, they're not too bad actually, and you know what, even at rip off eBay prices, this was uh, it's 12 inch by 16 inch, so just large enough for uh, an A500 motherboard as you can see. 
and uh, I think it's like seven pounds for 20, which is not bad. If you bought them direct from, I don't know, RS Online, Farnell, DigiKey, Mauser, uh, Rapid Electronics, you'll get them probably half to two thirds of that cost. So yeah, I've always struggled to find bags this large in the past though, so I'm very pleasantly surprised. And it just means that when transiting them from one side of the room to the other, before I've got a wrist strap on, uh, I've got less risk of uh, damaging them. I got the crusty Agnes back in there, uh, you know, we ruled that out so that wasn't the issue. You can see I've got a pie storm in here at the moment, that'll be uh, a video at some point soon. But I just wanted to point something else out. These pads here can be used to change the chip RAM configuration, I think. Um, it might swap the external for the internal, I'm not entirely sure, it may just swap the banks around. But these pads here, JP3, there's four of them, and I think as defaults, they are bridged just looking at this. I think it goes left pad to right pad left pad to right pad if you break those and go left pad to top pad that pad to that pad there yeah so they went upwards instead of across you flip the ram configuration around uh, now as i say i am not and someone might be able to post in the comments down below i'm not clear as whether it swaps the first bank with the second bank here you know you've got half meg half meg and it swaps them around or whether it swaps the external for the internal there but that's one way to maybe get around the yellow screen issue to get further you know to understand further what's going on the interesting thing with the yellow screen on this we did see yellow screen on the 2000 in the same way a couple of times actually i did a yellow screen repair on that and um, normally one of the things that kickstart does when it boots it does a uh, quick chip ram test doesn't test all the range and doesn't test every address etc it just does a quick test and if there's any issue there you'll get a green screen so that's always you know okay we've got a clue but not always if you've seen some of the early a500 repairs i did you'll note that you can sometimes even get uh, stuck completely. You don't get a green screen. With 1.3, you get stuck on one of the screens there. You know, it goes like dark gray, light gray. It can freeze there. Sometimes you can go dark gray, light gray, and freeze on the white, actually, because the stack's knackered, and sometimes it'll flash code on the uh, keyboard. So it's interesting, you get green screen, yellow screen, gray screen. You can get all sorts of weird problems when you get a problem with chip RAM. Now I always get asked what software I'm using or what ROM or whatever. Well, I was using one of these Boobip ROMs here, dead easy to program up on your own PC. I'll stick a link to the video for that up there. These are out of stock at the moment. Um, but yeah, I put Diagram on there. But you could also use Logica. The memory testing uh, features, uh, certainly compared to older versions of Diagram, are better in Logica. But Logica doesn't always boot, and that's an interesting one. You'll see that in an upcoming A500 video. I have a scenario where there's a fault in a 500. Logica doesn't boot at all, but Diagram does. So I hope you found something interesting in the video. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. Just like to thank all my patrons for supporting me for the last two years and wish everybody uh, a great Christmas and uh, hopefully a happy, positive, uh, productive 2022. I'll catch you in the next video.